Welcome to 2819. This is the show where we aim to inspire you to go and make disciples of all nations. I'm Sandra Dimas. And I'm Brian Rollenbacher, and this is the television outreach of Reasons to Believe, a viewer-supported ministry where science and faith converge. And as you're watching the show, if you want to support resources like 2819, visit reasons.org 2819 and give us some support. And while you're checking out our website, after that, make sure you go to YouTube, Make sure you hit that subscribe button below because we want you to stay up to date on all the new videos Reasons to Believe is producing. And you know what? We love to stay connected with our viewers, so we'd love to hear from you. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're at 2819show. And if you're like me, you like listening to podcasts while you drive to and from work or doing errands, whatever, so make sure you hit up the podcast version of this show. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and now we're on Spotify. Just search Reasons to Believe Podcast and you can find us there. Well, it's time for a rundown. So in our Nexus segment, we're going to hear from astrophysicist Jeff Swearing. He's going to address the question, is Earth getting warmer? Feels hot to me right now. Yes. And you know, that's kind of always a hot topic. Uh, Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But people kind of do get up in arms. It tends to be a sensitive one these days. So to follow that one up, Sandra will be talking with philosopher Ken Samples and Culture Talk about maintaining Christian character, even in the comment section. That's so savage sometimes, and it's important to be able to understand when we've crossed that line from disagreeing to maybe being super harsh. So Mm -hmm. after that, we're going to hear from astrophysicist Jeff Zwerink. He'll talk with theologian and RTB visiting scholar Kenny Rhodes about the question, why did he become an old earth creationist? First up, we're going to hear from Krista Bontrager. She'll talk with astronomer Hugh Ross about the question, does an ancient universe support evolution? Let's check it out. Now it's time for RTV 101. This is the segment where we talk about practical questions to help train you to share your faith with friends and family more effectively. And here to help me talk about a very common question is astronomer Dr. Hugh Ross. Welcome back, Hugh. Thank you. Now... When we say that we are old earth creationists, immediately one of the questions that comes up is confusion about our position regarding evolution. So I'm hoping we can help to clear up some of those questions today about does an, a belief in an ancient universe mean that we support evolution? So let's first start off with a very brief definition of what is old earth creationism. Old Earth creation is the belief that uh, the Earth and the universe are old, not just thousands of years okay. old, but literally billions of years old, and that God intervenes through miraculous means uh, frequently uh, throughout those billions of years. Very good. Okay, so when we use the word evolution, that's when another piece comes into confusion because There's a thing called stellar evolution, and then we talk about biological evolution, and those sound like the same words. So when we say that the universe is old and that stars evolved, uh, let's break that part of the definition down. Well, that's very good, Krista, because evolution basically means change with respect to time. Okay. So you and I are evolving. We've been watching each other evolve for 20 years now, yes. (laughs) Raindrops evolve. Okay. Uh, And we have stars evolving. So like stellar evolution is simply a description of the burning history of stars. Okay. Similar to what happens when you burn wood on on open fire. Uh, What we see is that burning wood changes over the course of time. Same thing with stars. In the case of stars, it's a very simple change is taking place. Okay. Whereas with life, we're looking at very complex changes occurring. And there we find the challenge, okay, how can you get all these complex changes happening without supernatural intervention? Okay, very good. So even though we're using the same word, evolution, we have to understand kind of what's behind the word. When we talk about stellar evolution, we're talking about something very different than biological evolution. Well, the word evolution just means change. It's not identifying what's responsible for the changes. And this is where the philosophy gets into it. What is behind the evolutionary changes we're observing? Is it miraculous intervention or is it strictly natural? So we would say that stellar evolution, stars, quote unquote, evolving, galaxies evolving, that is basically just a result of physics, whereas biological evolution, something far more complicated is happening there. That's correct. A lot of lay people don't realize the physics of raindrop evolution is actually more complicated than the physics of stellar evolution. Okay. 
So when we think about biological evolution, we're asking a, sort of a different question of how does life come from non-life? How do these changes get implemented over time? Whereas what we're saying is that stellar evolution, we see good evidence for that. Biological evolution, we're skeptical that that's how God chose to create. We can explain stellar evolution and raindrop evolution by physics and chemistry. Okay. Physics and chemistry, in our opinion at least, and based on our scientific analysis, is not by itself adequate to explain the origin of life, the history of life, where consciousness comes from. Okay. So we're a yes on stellar evolution, and we're skeptical on the question of biological evolution. Oh, we're skeptical on the idea that biological evolution is strictly natural. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Now, what importance can you see this question having when we're sharing our faith with non-Christians? Like, how does this question of whether or not evolution and old earth creationism are the same thing? Like, how does that help me in my evangelism? Well, we gotta be careful not to talk past one another. Okay. So I would tell Christians, you need to define what kind of evolution you're talking about. You need to be explicit about what you think the causation behind the changes we're seeing is coming from. Now you can have a conversation. But if the person you're talking to has a different definition in mind than you have, uh, you could be leading to a lot of frustrating dialogue. So when we're talking to non-Christians, they're, they're going to probably assume about us that we're skeptical about all kinds of evolution, and we might think the universe is thousands of years old. So we might need to make sure that we're clear on our definitions and, and what, what we mean. And where we think supernatural intervention occurs and where natural evolution or natural processes accounting for the changes. Very good. So we would say supernatural intervention on the biological side, whereas... Well, even on the biological side, there is some natural process okay. change taking place. I mean, all creationists believe that microevolution is natural. Good point. That's the macroevolution, but there again, I think it's important. What do you mean by macroevolution? Very good. And where do you think the supernatural input is essential? And what is your scientific evidence that the supernatural input is essential? Now you can have a meaningful dialogue where I think you can make some progress. I think it's important too to say, this is not in any of the creeds of the church. And so this is not a salvation issue, but often it's an evangelism issue. If you're actually gonna make some progress in showing people that this is not a conflict between science and the Christian faith, then these issues need to be talked about. Excellent way to round out the segment. And I want to encourage all of you, if you're, if you're watching, and we used a few terms that were new, uh, macroevolution, microevolution. If you catch some past episodes of RTB 101, we have little um, bits about those terms. So you can get caught up in, on our YouTube channel about that. And Hugh, I want to thank you for joining us today. And I want to encourage all of you to check out Hugh's blog, Today's New Reason to Believe. Is the planet getting warmer? This is a simple question with huge implications. A significant number of people today believe global warming is not only happening, but that it is primarily caused by humans. There's also a good-sized group who believe global warming is probably happening, but it's all part of the natural ebb and flow of Earth's temperature, and there's little or nothing we can do to stop it. Then there are those who are skeptical that global warming is even happening. In order to get to the bottom of this debate, we need to investigate three distinct questions. What causes changes to the global climate? How do we know if the planet is getting warmer? And who or what is responsible for these changes to the global climate? Let's take a look at that first question. What causes changes to the global climate? Global climate change involves a complex interplay between four factors that affect the temperature of the surface of the Earth the brightness of the sun, gases in the Earth's atmosphere, the location and percentages of continents, and the life forms. This brings us to our second question. How do we know if the planet is getting warmer? To answer this, we first need to understand the difference between climate and weather. Climate patterns are long-term conditions, crossing decades, centuries, and even millennia. Weather patterns are more short-term, ranging from minutes to seasons. So that's why we can have an unseasonably cold winter one year, but still be talking about global warming. The scientific community has been tracking the weather since 1850. The data is very compelling 
that over the last 150 years, the average global temperature has increased by about half to one degree Celsius, or one to two degrees Fahrenheit. This probably sounds like an inconsequential amount, but when you factor it over the entire globe, this small change is having consequences that we can measure. But we also have valuable data from other sources that were present going back to 400,000 years ago. And what we see is that Earth's temperature has fluctuated within a 20 degrees Celsius window. But even that large window has allowed for a thriving, diverse array of animal and bacterial life. We live in a time where there has been relative stability of the planet's temperature. So let's review the verifiable agreed upon facts. Fact number one, over the past 150 years, we are trending towards getting warmer. Fact number two, the Earth has experienced a series of climate changes throughout its history, far more dramatic than the one we're experiencing currently. Fact number three, Earth's climate involves several interdependent factors, and sometimes a few small changes have had a profound long-term impact on the planet. These three facts point to an interesting observation. The optimal time for humans to be able to survive and thrive on our planet is in the current window of time. So let's tackle our third question. Are humans responsible for global warming? The answer to that question is yes. Scientists are widely agreed that humans are at least partly responsible for an increase in the Earth's temperature. But to what degree? That's much more complicated. Part of the problem is we haven't developed the technology to figure it out with great precision. Based on what we know right now, the best estimates say that humans are 30 to 70% responsible for the current climate change, with natural processes accounting for the remaining 30 to 70%. Our current technology does not allow us to be more definitive. We don't have enough data to accurately assess why our climate has been remarkably stable over the last 8,000 years, and exactly why it started going up over the last 50. The bottom line is this, all reliable data is that the planet is getting warmer. What this means is debated. In the future, we may be able to develop new technology that will help us gather more data and be better positioned to answer this question. Until then, Christians need to get beyond merely restating our views of global warming based on our political party affiliations and seek what God would have us to do to care for this great world he's made for us to live in and enjoy. For more on the integration of science and the Christian faith, check out Jeff's blog, Impact Events. Just go to reasons.org and search Impact Events. Now it's time for Culture Talk. This is the segment where we talk about the intersection of science, faith, and pop culture and how culturally relevant topics can be used to start conversations about your faith. I'm joined today with philosopher and theologian Ken Samples. Hi, Sandra. Thank you for joining me. We're going to be talking about something we see all too often, and that is not nice comments. <laughs> <laughs> not nice comments and um, how we can maintain Christian character sure. even in the comment section. So unfortunately, we see comments uh and we get feedback even from, I, I think you've had interactions with people where... Oh, yeah. They are going to use straw man attacks, and they're going to be unkind in responding to either an argument or maybe even, like for us, our parents and right. different things that we'll see um, in the comment section. Oh, yeah. um, how, as a, as a well-known speaker, someone who is out there, how do you handle such attacks and criticism. Well, it's it's never easy mm -hmm. to it's not easy to be gracious to someone who's not returning the favor right. to you. However, when I'm on social media, I'm cognizant of the fact that somebody's watching, somebody's mm -hmm. observing. And in fact, the arguments that I'm presenting, Sandra, may be more relevant for people that are observing than the very right. person that I'm interacting with. So I try to stay away from I, I try to stay away from the, the cutting remark, mm -hmm. try to keep my mind on what's the point, what's the argument, what am, I, what am I attempting to reason to and for. And so in doing that, I realize that there may be other people that are going to benefit, even if this person isn't so gracious. Right. It's something that we're kind of used to hearing and seeing is this keyboard courage where yeah. people are very bold because they're online. They don't have to say it to exactly. your face. 
And, uh, you know, that's something that we all have to deal with. Anyone who's in, in the limelight or in, in a public arena, we have to kind of um, wade through that. And you offer some really good t- tips in your podcast. It's seven traits of intellect or excuse me, seven traits of apologetic integrity. Yes. Can you give us maybe some of the highlights from those seven traits? Yeah. The the first one I start with is, is being respectful Mm -hmm. and being respectful doesn't mean you necessarily agree with the person. Uh, You know, you can always be tolerant of the person, even if you're not accepting of the argument that they're giving. And so Mm -hmm. an, an attitude of respect, at least granting they're made in the image of God they're presenting a point of view, I'm going to hear it. I'm going to listen to it, even if I don't agree with it. I think also being fair-minded, uh, mm-hmm. Sandra. And, and that means that I'm not going to try to look at their argument in the worst light possible. I'm, I'm going to try to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to try to be fair. I'm going to try to be reasonable. And then I just think overall being charitable. Right. How, how can I treat other people? I, I like the golden rule of apologetics which simply means um, that I'm going to try to treat other people's ideas the way I want mine treated. doesn't mean mm-hmm. I accept them, mm-hmm. but it means I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, be fair-minded, and try to be charitable. And you talk about in your podcast about examples of when that doesn't happen. And you use the karate that you took as a kid yeah, yeah. and this karate stance that you take. So what happens then in these interactions when somebody comes at you and they're using ridicule or sarcasm, um, we all tend to then go to this defensive stance. And you talk about that, this karate stance that you take. Um, And it's a way to kind of prepare ourselves for the, the blows that are coming our way. And one of your points that I love in the seven traits is that you talk about being able to disagree without being disagreeable. Yeah. What does that look like? Yeah, and, and again, I think that's differentiating the person from the argument. Mm-hmm. I, may, I may not like the argument. I may not be persuaded by the argument. Uh, but that that doesn't mean that I have to be disagreeable to the mm-hmm. person. I like, I like to be tolerant of people always, mm-hmm. intolerant of bad ideas. And so if we can if we can take it away from the, the personal, stay away from sarcasm, ridicule, mm-hmm. ad hominem, all of those are so so personal in orientation. If I can bring it back to the argument and have a civil discussion. Now, of course, I've said all of these things. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean I'm always perfect in the way right. I carry them out. And we have to ask the Lord, Lord, help me to, to be to be effective in communicating my Christian faith. But help me to, to love people uh, the way the Holy Spirit would have me to. Right. And that's a great reminder. I know for me, when I see comments like that and I'm feeling, you know, hurt oh, yeah, or sure. a little angry, I just stay away. And that's sometimes yeah. our option, um, especially online. We can just say, you know what? I'm not going to engage in this because especially if it doesn't have to do with the argument, but more appearance or um, attacking a person versus the, the and, argument. And what you write on the, online is going to be there for a long time. Right. So no thank you. I'll stay away. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, You're Ken. Welcome. I highly recommend listening to Ken's podcast. Go to reasons.org and search for seven traits of apologetic integrity. Now we're going to head to Give and Take, where Jeff Swearing will talk with theologian Kenny Rhodes, and he's going to ask him about how he came from Young Earth Creationism to Old Earth Creationism. Let's check it out. Hello, Jeff Zwerink, and welcome again to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas to help you be more confident in the truth of Christianity. Today I'm joined by Kenny Rhodes, and I'm excited because we're going to discuss what prompted him to take a journey from Young Earth Creationism to Old Earth Creationism. Kenny, good to have you here today. Great to be here. So kind of give us a little bit of your background. I know you've been a Christian for most of your life, Well, you know, I was born and raised in church Mm -hmm. and became a Christian at eight years old Mm -hmm. and uh, surrendered to the ministry at 19. Mm -hmm. And so uh, started to serve in my own Baptist church. And uh, from the time I could remember, uh, I was taught that this is what the Bible taught. It taught a young universe. Mm -hmm. And even when I went in to be a senior pastor myself. How long were you a senior pastor? I was senior pastor for 10 years. 10 years, okay. Yeah. And uh, 
not only did I hold to young earth creationism, I taught it. Mm -hmm. I taught it on TV. Okay. I did seminars. So I was very much in the young earth creation camp. Well, and you've got a little bit of stake in it by the time you, you've been yes. that, that sort of public with it. So. Yes, yes. I, I, I even lost some friends over the switch. Hmm, okay. Yeah. So uh, I, you've got a theological, philosophical background, yes. correct? Yes, sir. So yeah. you kind of come at this not from the what does the science have to say, but more how do we deal with Scripture? One of the most important aspects of our theology is we approach uh, the, uh, the biblical text in a normal, literal sense. And so the important thing is to take Scripture as you would any other language. Mm -hmm. So this is literal. the historical, grammatical? That's correct. That's the, the terminology yeah. for it there? Yeah. So as you're applying that method, what in, what in Scripture kind of had you start thinking, well, maybe young earth is not the proper interpretation. Well, you know, there were a few things. It was uh, my exposure to Thomas Aquinas, who okay. spoke very much about the relationship of faith and reason, mm -hmm. and how uh, reason can inform us mm -hmm. and help us in even if we've got it right in the biblical text, because God's reality, God's works, and God's uh, word should come together. It's the same author. Mm -hmm. So that okay. was one of the things. And then, of course, taking the text at face value. So what I did is I just um, sat down, looked at the text and said, okay, I want to take it literally, Okay. but I also want to engage the issues of how do we know what we know mm -hmm. and how, does, how should language, number one, because all of us approach the scripture um, not in a vacuum, but there's there's our understanding of reality, how mm -hmm. we perceive reality. So language, uh, the philosophy of language uh, is there uh, before we start. And so I wanted to find out, okay, do I understand how language works right? Mm -hmm. Do I understand how reality and philosophy? So mm -hmm. when I came to the text, uh, the first thing was, is when I looked at the literal interpretation of the text, was to understand that Genesis 1-1 was not part of the days of creation. So what do you mean by that? Because you know, it's obviously there in Genesis 1, so how can it not be part of the days? Well, what we notice, if you take the text literally, which means you're taking it according to its normal usage, usage mm -hmm. you look at the syntax and the culture and the background and the dictionaries and all that kind of stuff. So when you begin to do that and parse this stuff out, you find that bara is in an imperfect uh, or a perfect tense, which, which means, means God had created in the beginning. Okay, so, so that bara in the beginning God created. That's God had bara created. There. Yeah, God bara. had created. Okay. God had created. So we have a perfect there, and not only that, we have a hindiades, which is uh, two ideas through or one idea through through two words. Okay. So we've got time, space, matter, energy. So that is your ex nihilo creation event. Okay. But then, right after, between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, there is a time gap there. Now, I'm not talking about the gap theory or anything like that, but the narrative comes out in such a way that in the beginning, God had created the universe, mm -hmm. and now that's background, and now here's where the story of Genesis 1 is starting. And the six days of creation are not a part of the universe. They're a part of God forming and filling the earth for the inhabitants of biological creatures and man. Mm -hmm. And what really sold it was Exodus 20 that people are always using to say, look, four in six days God created. But I looked at that and it's and the scripture says four in six or not the prepositions not there, but in six days God created the 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 heavens, which in that context should be sky, mm -hmm. earth, and sea. Okay. It's not the same. Right, as in okay. Genesis 1.1. There seems there's a real drive in what you're doing to take the Bible on its own terms, to not bring what you want in there to be there or have some notion of what ought to be there, but of saying, what does it say and how am I the most faithful, most faithful to what the text is saying? And I got frustrated with how there was this big fight mm -hmm. and... Um, I always admired Dr. Ross for his Christian character, mm -hmm. and I saw the Big Bang uh, as actually not anti-God, but actually this is describing what's going on in Genesis here. Right. And it just really made me think. And one of the other keys was I noticed that uh, in the young earth uh, paradigm, what you're doing is you're assuming that you know what the text says, 
mostly in English, mm -hmm. and you're pushing that interpretation on the science. So you're trying to make the science fit what you think Scripture says, okay. when we should be looking at each one and letting the facts you know, speak for themselves mm -hmm. without any, any decision on what the answer is, and then let the meaning fall out of the text. And I found that that was science and the Scripture. They were saying the same thing when I let them speak for themselves, when I tried to take the most neutral position as right. I could. So we've kind of dug in on, you know, kind of this specific issue of Genesis 1-1 there. I know there were some other issues that uh, played into your journey there. What were some of those other issues, if you could kind of just list them off pretty quickly for yeah, us? Yeah, you know, I, I'm going to be writing uh, two blogs. Uh, mm -hmm. One that has to do with general concerns, and the other one is particular issues. And this issue of how we know what we know, mm -hmm. epistemology, the issue of how to interpret Scripture, how to right. approach Scripture, uh, science and faith issues, how they relate, faith and, and uh, reason and faith, how they mm -hmm. relate to one another, and then some specific things um, with uh, death before the fall right. of Adam. that's a big one. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a huge one for uh, young earthers. And those specific texts, a little bit like what I talked about on how Genesis 1 uh, truly was not teaching always in a most literal sense, six days. Can you interpret it? Sure, but it doesn't necessarily have to be interpreted that way. So a lot of issues that I'll be bringing up in the blogs. Well, I really appreciate your comments, Kenny. It's been enjoyable talking to you. Thank you. You know, when we look at Scripture, as we really do hold it in high regard and let it speak on its own terms, you can make a very strong case, as Kenny has made here, that the best interpretation is that those are meant to be long periods of time and that harmonizes really well with Big Bang cosmology and what scientists are finding. You know what, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org, search for Kenny Rhodes, that's K-E-N-N-Y, R-H-O-D-E-S, and you'll find a number of his blogs, these two in particular, that flesh out how he moved from a young earth creationist to an old earth creationist, and how you can use that information to be confident in the truth of Christianity and spread that truth to those around. That does it for us this week on 2819. We hope that you've been really encouraged to share your faith with confidence, compassion, and nicely in the comment section. <laughs> and if you feel encouraged to support resources like this show, please visit reasons.org 2819. And don't forget, grab your phone, go on your laptop, find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 2819show. Let us know what you like about the show. Yeah, give us some comments and some likes and let us know what you think about my brown vest. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>